And good evening once again. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Heartland and the Word on Wednesdays. Our uh, ministry here on Wednesday nights where we seek to just teach God's Word and go through the Bible. Um, if you've been with us for a while, you know we're in the, currently studying the book of Exodus and we'll get right back into that tonight. Um, pick up where we left off last week at the end of chapter 6 there around verse 28. But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so very much for your word. We thank you so very much for the way you love us, your grace and your mercy, and for the sacrifice made for us. And so, Father, uh, we just want to give you all the praise and all the glory and start out with our worship to you. But Father, we ask that you fill us tonight, fill us with your spirit, give us eyes to see and, and ears to hear. Open our hearts, Lord. Speak into us wisdom from your word. Speak to us directly from your word as we study tonight. We pray you join us here in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you were with us last week during that study, you'll remember we kind of we ended there in chapter 6 towards the end. Uh, we left a couple of verses uh, to, to go over tonight, but we ended with this, this genealogy, this short little genealogy uh, concerning Moses and Aaron. And, and the writer here seemed to want to uh, provide us with uh, a clear understanding of this connection that this Moses and Aaron had to the patriarchs, uh, back to Jacob, and, and to the people, and also to some of the descendants uh, that will come from Aaron uh, in the future and, and what's going to play out here. And so uh, we saw that. And then and before that, in the study last week, we had seen Moses actually make his first approach to Pharaoh. And according to the people, it didn't go as they expected. And even Moses seemed a little disappointed in the way the meeting went. Which is funny because God had told him exactly what was going to happen. God had told him what that meeting would produce. And yet he seems a little uh, upset about it. And, and he comes out. And of course the people are upset because they, they had accepted him back. We had seen this. They, they had, had rallied around. Oh great, we're going to finally be freed. And, and you've spoken with God and God has heard our cry but the meeting didn't go so well. But what does God do? God instructs them to go back again. He says, y'all need to go back to both Aaron and Moses. Actually, he commands them. He gives them a command for the people and a command for Pharaoh. But Moses, Moses is back to, remember the original calling before he gets back to Egypt, and when he Excuse after excuse after excuse, right? Well, he goes back to that mode and, and he throws up an excuse. And then we had the, the genealogy. And then right after that, we're going to pick up tonight in verse 28 there in chapter 6, where he's going to remind us, the writer reminds us of that excuse that he's just, uh, just thrown back up at God of why he's not the man for this and he can't do it. And, and then we'll see beginning in chapter 7, God's reply. But let's look at verse 28 of chapter 6. And it came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me. You see, God had previously commanded Moses to speak to Pharaoh. And at that first meeting, there was this disappointing experience. It didn't go as everyone thought it would. And, and, and Pharaoh had just rejected and said, no, he didn't heed. And so, but God had told him, God had specifically told him that's the way it was going to go. And so, so he tells him to go back. And now Moses says, I can't. I am of uncircumcised lips. I'm not worthy. Now that could have meant he, he, he doesn't feel like he's eloquent enough again to speak. Remember that was one of his excuses before. 
But I think the, the way he phrases this of uncircumcised, like he's telling God, I'm not worthy. I can't speak on your behalf to him. But whatever the reason is, the fact is he don't want to go. And he doesn't want to go back. And so, but God, here's the thing. God's going to deal with Moses and God can take care of his uncircumcised lips. God can deal with any of the circumstances and his abilities just like he can with us. Whether they're real, whether they're imagined. What's hindering you from doing God's calling, from doing God's work? God can deal with that. Just be obedient. And that's all he wants from Moses. Just be obedient. And so God's going to remind him and God's going to speak back to him now and answer him beginning in verse 1 in chapter 7. So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. And Aaron your brother shall speak to Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. I find it interesting. God, after all of these excuses, God still shows just amazing patience with Moses. What a, what a testament to his grace, to his mercy. You know, the, just patience. He could have he really just chastised Moses, but he doesn't. He simply tells him what he wants him to do and sends him to do it. But it's interesting here. He says, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, remember, back in chapter 5, had specifically rejected dealing directly with God. He had said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know your God. I'm not even going to deal with your God. God says, you are going to deal with me. You'll do it through Moses. I'll make Moses as God to you. And we see that idea even carried over in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to the believer that the believers are like letters written by Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is the heart. In other words, you, the people, represent God and His Word in everything we do. If the people won't go directly to God, if the people won't read God's Word, if the people won't have that personal relationship, then they will see Him through us. God says, then they will see them through you. They will see me through you. And, and just as Pharaoh, Pharaoh's going to see God for who he is through Moses. And he says, Aaron, your brother will be a prophet. The prophet is the spokesman, the person that speaks for God. God's word. And Aaron's going to speak for Moses. And he's going to represent and just as Moses has to wait on God to direct him, Aaron has to wait on Moses to give him the words to speak. It's not on his own initiative. So they are going to go back. They will be obedient and they will go back to Pharaoh. But it's not going to go as smoothly as they probably want it to. And God's actually going to remind them and he's going to let them know up front how it's going to go. Look at verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Just as in the previous statement of God hardening Pharaoh's heart, we see again him saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. But remember that God's not hardening Pharaoh's heart against his own desire, against Pharaoh's own will. All God's doing is he's hardening his heart. He's confirming Pharaoh's inclination against the Hebrews, against Israel. He's revealed his heart. And so God's just going to strengthen 
that in Pharaoh. The evil that he's already chosen. And we see that sometimes in people today. In our rebellion. You know, if you continuously rebel and rebel and rebel, at some point, God will give you over to that rebellion. We, last week, we looked at this verse in Romans. Remember, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to their uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. They already had made that decision. They were set in their ways, and God gave, up, gave, gave them over to their, their own lusts. And so even as Pharaoh, even, even as God hardens his heart, God still gives him reasons through his signs and his wonders. He gives him what he needs to, to believe and to surrender. He proves who he is. He shows him who he is. It's all up to Pharaoh whether he wants to or not. God's going to show his power. And he's going to show his power so that there's no excuse in the end for them to say, well, I didn't know. I really didn't know who you were. Because he's going to show who he is. But Pharaoh, Pharaoh's not going to believe. Look at verse 4. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. See, they're going to know exactly who he is. In verse 6, Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. You see, God knew from the very beginning that Pharaoh's not going to agree to Moses' demands and his request. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And it's no surprise, and nothing surprises him today. But all of it's going to work out for God's purposes. He says, he's, they're going to know, I'm going to lay my hand on Egypt, and the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord. They're going to know exactly who he is. And not just Pharaoh, but all the Egyptians. They're going to see all of this play out. That kind of explains why... <coughs> He's given Pharaoh over and hardened his heart to bring his righteous judgment upon Egypt in order to reveal himself. Even to those who've rejected him, they're going to know. <coughs> Excuse me. We know someday, one day, all knees will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. All knees, even those who had rejected. You see, one day they will know. Pharaoh, back in chapter 5, had proclaimed that he didn't know this God. Who is this God? But in the end, he's not going to be able to claim that. God's going to let them know. God, God has planned this work so that they will see that he was Lord and I think he does the same type of work even today in the church. Displaying his wisdom. Uh, displaying both through faithful and through fallen men. Um, he, he does it in our individual lives. Displaying his goodness and his power through the world. But what we're going to see happen is we're going to see a bunch of miracles. A bunch of plagues of, that are going to take place. And through all of them, we're going to see it's an invitation. It's an invitation for the Egyptians to come and to believe on the Lord. And apparently some do. We see in chapter 12, as we get when we get there in a few weeks, that there was a mixed multitude that left Egypt with Israel. So it wasn't just the Hebrews that leave Egypt when they eventually leave. But a mixed multitude of Egyptians go with them. Because they will be convinced. They will know who this God is. 
And then he leaves that section off with Moses was 80 and, and Aaron 83 years old. Just a reminder that we're never too old to do God's work. And God's going to work through them. Moses has been waiting for a lot of years. He was 40 when he left Egypt the first time. He was almost 80 when he went back. And so the real work now is just going to begin in this old man. And the challenges are just going to begin. And they begin with the showing of these miraculous signs. And we see in verse 8, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Now if you recall, back in chapter 4, there was a very similar sign there on Mount Sinai. That it was this the sign that that Moses was going to use for the people when he first came back to uh, to show the people that he was representing God, right? But this is not exactly the same miracle, and and we know that or we see that because. In that instance, it turned into a snake, a serpent. In this instance, it's a different word that's used here in the Hebrew for the word serpent. In this particular word, uh, it's the word tannin, and it's translated great serpent, dragon, or crocodile. It was actually more of a picture of, of a crocodile-type figure that was something that was would have been very clear to the Egyptians. It, it was something that... Um, would have meant something to the Egyptians because it was basically a symbol of Egypt itself. It was a symbol they used to represent Egypt. And we kind of know that from the Psalms, Psalm 74 and in Ezekiel, um, where it talks about that. But so it was something that would mean something to the audience. It turns into this, this serpent, this, uh, this creature, crocodile-like creature that would mean something. And that's important because we're going to see in a minute some of these, all of these plagues have a purpose of going against specific uh, Egyptian gods. And we'll, we'll see that in a minute. But here's the thing. Pharaoh's Egypt magicians, they're going to be able to imitate it. And we're going to see that here in verse 11. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt... They also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So right here in the midst of this unmistakable miracle that Pharaoh had asked them to show a miraculous sign, they did it, and right in the middle of it, Pharaoh calls his magicians in, and we see them do the same thing. And people think, well, how do magicians... Uh, I believe it's just Satan. Satan's providing Pharaoh with a reason to doubt. Pharaoh is, is now got something he can seize on that will just help him harden his heart even more. Um, magi magic, magic or magicians were, were very prevalent in Egypt during that time. There are a number of writings, a number of papyri that deal with the subject, um, I just believe it's very much Satan and the demonic order. Um, we know that, uh, we, we see in Second Thessalonians that, that miracles, or at least apparent miracles, are part of Satan's arsenal. Um, in Second Thessalonians it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. That kind of tells us that miracles, they can prove something's supernatural, but they can't really prove truth, that it's true. And so these Egyptians, you know, 
these magicians, they were learned men. They were intelligent. But they didn't have the wisdom of God. And actually, we know that, that they were learned. We know that because Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, speaking about a couple of these magicians right here resisting Moses, it says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres, that's two of the names of these magicians, resisted Moses, so do they also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. And so it's this battle of good and evil. Of course, God always has the last word, right? And he'll have the last word in this round, as we saw right there in that passage, because what happens to their serpents when they try to mimic what he just did? Aaron's rod swallows up their rods. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard. God is showing that my rod is superior to your rods. God sent in a clear message. But Pharaoh ignores it. Pharaoh ignores it. Charles Spurgeon actually preached a, a message once that was entitled, The Power of Aaron's Rod, in which he used... This is an example of the truth that God's power is greater than anything else and can swallow up our idols and our sins. But God's not done, so God sends Moses back. So now, he didn't believe the miraculous signs. His Pharaoh's heart hardens. And so, now it's time to put on the heavy hand. All right? And the plagues are going to come. So God sends Moses back. Look at verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. And when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent, you shall take it in your hand. And you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood, and the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. And so we see the first plague that's going to come. And so, as all the plagues are going to end up doing, it's going to harden Pharaoh's heart even more against God and his people. But in God's mercy, God is warning Pharaoh. He's warning him. Go to Pharaoh and tell him this is what's going to happen. If Pharaoh really recognized and honored God, he would have freed the children of Israel. But he doesn't. He's going to hold them anyway. He sins against Israel and against the Lord. And so now the river will become blood. Look at verse 19. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood, both in pitchers of stone. In other words, all the water. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died. The river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And so the first plague, there'll be nine total. There's ten. But the tenth, it's kind of in, a, in a, a class all its own. That's where um, the slaying of the firstborn. But the first nine, they're kind of grouped in together in groups of three. And we see the first one. And in this structure, what we see is the first two, they come with a warning. And then after the warning, the warning, a call to repentance, a call to change. 
When that doesn't happen after the warning, then it happens. The plague happens. And then after the first two and nothing changes, the third comes out of nowhere with no warning. And we'll see that repeated a couple of times. And so here we see the first. And, and there are many people out there over the course of, of the history that will tell you that all these plagues and all these things have this, this naturalistic explanation. And for example, in this first one, they say that there's this, that when, when the Nile would reach extreme flood stages, there was this finely powdered red earth that would get collected and it would turn the water red and um, it would carry the, these organisms and it would kill the fish and all these things. The problem with that is that wouldn't just happen instantaneously with the touching of a rod. And if that were the case, it wouldn't explain how that could possibly impress Pharaoh. It wouldn't, wouldn't be a big deal to him. And so, and also, how would Moses, Moses and Aaron would have to be supernatural in, a, in a, to know exactly, okay, it's going to turn red at, at this time, so let's touch it now. They would have to be in cahoots with the natural. It all speaks to God. God is causing. And, and that's not to say that God can't or didn't use natural mechanisms with some of these plagues. He could. But even if he did, it was the character of the plagues themselves that could only come from God's hand alone. And so it's important to understand. It's also important to understand these things were real. This really happened in history. The Nile turned to blood and all the water. And that kind of helps us guide our understanding of the plagues that come later in, in, in the book of Revelation. There's no reason to see them as simply symbolic. They're real events that will take place. That's why it's so important to understand God's Word. And to believe God's word. Now these plagues do have a symbolic meanings as well. But they're real events that took place. Each of them will confront and attack a prized Egyptian deity. The Egyptian gods. And so not only are they bringing punishment against Egypt. But they're answering that initial question Pharaoh had. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? You see, they're gonna sh these plagues are going to show exactly who God is and who He is in relation to all of these gods you think you have here in Egypt. And so there was blood through all the land of Egypt, right? It's interesting, the Nile itself was actually worshipped as a god by the Egyptians. And, and here God says, i got complete power over that god. Right? There's a, the, the name Num that was the guardian of the Nile, was an Egyptian god. Happy was the spirit of the Nile, was another Egyptian god. The great god Osiris was thought to have the Nile in his bloodstream. Right? And God is showing, I have control over, I'm, I'm greater than all of them. The Nile itself was worshipped as a god. Many writings, recording hymns sung in praise of the river. There's even, there's even a writing of papyrus. It's called the Apur papyrus. It it's actually talks about this event. So outside of the biblical account, we have a papyrus in, in Egypt that talks about during, it was written during this general period of time that says the Nile was blood and undrinkable and that servants left their masters. It's a real event that took place. But Satan, he's not giving up so easily. He's going to try. So the magicians come in again. And look at verse 22. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, and the Lord had, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither 
was his heart moved by this? So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. So evidently the magicians even did so themselves. Even the, I, I'm not sure where they found fresh water because the water had already been turned. Um, there's the, many scholars believe they dug fresh wells just to find fresh water just so they could prove they could do it too. Which is interesting because if they were really magicians, if they really had this power, if they were really greater than God, why didn't they turn the bloody Nile back to clean water? That would have been the thing to do. Now that would have been a miracle, right? But you see, Satan doesn't, doesn't do constructive things. He does destructive things. So they just make the matter worse. They just create more problems, more bloody water. And Pharaoh's heart grows harder and harder with every, with, with every event that takes place. So once again, he takes this opportunity to dishonor and reject the Lord. So, the second plague is coming. And that's where we start chapter 8 and verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, and they may, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, and on your bed, into the houses of your servants, and on your people, and into your ovens, and into your kneading bowls. And the frog shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. You know, God, he could have he just ended this whole thing if he had just brought that tenth plague, if he had just, just started right there. Because this series of plagues we're going to go through, they're going to end with death coming to almost every household. But he doesn't. And he didn't for a determined purpose. He's going to use this series of plagues to glorify himself, especially above all these gods of Egypt that we're going to see as these go, we go through. As we saw with the Nile, we see again with the frogs, because the frogs have an important distinction in Egypt. But it's really to give Pharaoh and to give the Egyptians a chance to repent. Every one of the, he gives them a warning again. He tells him right there. He says, go to Pharaoh and tell him this. Warn him that this is what I want you to do, but if you refuse to do it, this is what's going to happen. So here we have the warning. The second plague, the second warning. But Her Pharaoh, I can't say Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart will not change. So God here threatens a plague of frogs, right? I will smite all your territory with frogs. In Egypt, there was an Egyptian goddess, Higet or Heket. It was pictured with the head of a frog. Among the ancient Egyptians, frogs were considered sacred. They could not be killed. They worshiped the frog as a female goddess because frogs were common around the Nile and because they lived both in land, on land and in water they, they were seen as creatures of both worlds, of two worlds. They were these magnificent things, right? And God once again is displaying His command over one of their gods that they worshipped. Everything belongs to the one true God. Everything belongs to Him. And since Pharaoh's not going to heed, look what happens. Verse 5, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. And so Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up, covered the land of Egypt, and the magicians did so with their enchantments, and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. And so since the Egyptians... Egyptians worshipped the frog. God gave them the frogs. 
Gave him a plague of frogs. All part of his determined plan. I think it's kind of funny. He must have a sense of humor. And of course the magicians, with their enchantments, they said, we can do that too, and they bring up more frogs. So instead of retreating the frogs, fixing the problem, let's just compound it and bring up more. Wow. Make the situation worse. That's all Satan can do. This occultic power. But what it does do is it gives Pharaoh an excuse to continue to harden his heart further and further. However, it doesn't stop him from at least at this point trying a new tactic. He's going to ask Moses now for help with God. And this is interesting to me. Look at verse 8. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, and they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs from you and your houses, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God and the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, from your people. They shall remain in the river only. And then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh and Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards and out of the fields. They gathered them together in heaps and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So here we see God, as he had previously promised back at the beginning of chapter 7, the promise was fulfilled, right? As a prophet of God, Moses stood in the place of God before Pharaoh and Pharaoh made his request to God through Moses. Moses entreats. That's an, an unusual word, entreat. It means to intercede. Pharaoh, he, he intercedes on his behalf. It's interesting to me because Pharaoh doesn't go to his magicians this time to help him or to fix the situation. He goes to Moses. And, and it, on the surface, it appears initially that he's moved. He's been moved enough that he's like, okay, okay, I get it. I'll let the people go if you'll just get your God to stop this. Unfortunately, it's a promise he's not going to keep. It was just there on the surface. And so Moses does go to God, though, and God does listen to Moses, and God does according to the word of Moses. And there is relief. Although the land stank, there was relief from the frogs. But look at, look at Pharaoh. His heart is just hardened even more. And then he does not keep his word. And he does not let the people go. And we're going to see that this is going to become a familiar pattern. That he's just not going to keep his word. And no doubt that it, just as in this first instance, as it happens over and over again, it's going to get easier and easier, the harder his heart becomes. And so the third plague is going to come. But this time there's no warning beforehand. Verse 16, So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and he struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. So completely unannounced. No warning. They strike the land and the lice comes. Interesting. This plague in particular um, would have been especially 
uh, troublesome for the priests of Egypt. The Egyptian priesthood was extremely careful about their hygiene and their ritual cleansings. This would have made them, this infestation of lice would have made them completely unclean. And especially because it hit not only man, but beast. So all their sacrificial animals now could not be sacrificed. Because there was none clean anymore. And so he basically wipes out their whole sacrificial system. Right there. He says, I'm God. And notice this time too. The magicians. We don't see anything about the magicians, right? The magicians are going to be restrained. Look at verse 18. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice. Notice again, they're trying to do the same thing to duplicate it. They're not trying to get rid of the lice. But he says they so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. So even the magicians now have been restrained. And even the magicians, notice, tell Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. This shows that even Satan's power has limits. And God can limit it any time he wants. And even they start to recognize, this is God. This is someone far greater than anything we serve. But notice Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart just grows harder. And he did not heed them. He's at the place now in his heart where he won't even listen to his own advisors and their own critical analysis of what's going on around them. You ever know people in this world that won't listen to truth any longer because their hearts have grown so hard that they can't even see factual truth right in front of them anymore? They just refuse to heed or to even listen to rational thought. No rational reason. No rational reason for Pharaoh not to see this. Except that his heart has grown so hard at this point. And so the only thing that God can do is continue the plagues. And the plagues will continue. The fourth plague will be coming. But it's going to come next week. Because we're going to stop there tonight. And we will pick back up here in verse 20 when we come back next week. And look at the fourth plague. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word, for your, for the example that we see set before us, Lord. And so I just pray, Lord, that as you speak to us, that we would, Lord, you would impart your wisdom on us, that we would not become so hardened that we don't see you and all your glory and everything around us that we don't reject truth. And so I just pray, Lord, that you speak to those that need to hear, to all of us. I thank you for this evening. I thank you for this time. I pray that you go with us through this next week, that we might, that we might represent you to the world around us. In truth and in love. In Jesus' name, amen.